Next up, uh, we have um, Nancy Chen coming to us from the University of Rochester, um, who's going to be talking about the maintenance of genetic variation uh, for fitness in a pedigreed wild population of these wonderful birds. All right, thank you so much. So thank you um, to all the organizers for this opportunity to come share some of the work in our lab with you all. It's been a very fun couple days and I'm very much looking forward to the rest, continuing interactions for the rest of this conference. Um, so today I thought I would talk to you about one of the projects in the lab that's mainly focused on trying to understand kind of what maintains variation in um, individual fitness. So as we all know now, there's quite a bit of additive genetic variants for fitness in natural populations. I'm showing you here an excerpt of a figure from a really nice uh, recent paper by Timothy Bonet and all showing that um, we have quite a bit of additive genetic variants um, in fitness estimated in a number of different mammal populations um, in the world. And so why is this important? So one, remember that, you know, additive genetic variants in fitness will determine kind of a uh, population's ability to evolve. Um, and it's also a little bit of a paradox in evolutionary biology, right? So if there's natural selection, natural selection should act to erode variation in fitness. So why do we still see so much um, variation in fitness in nature. Um, so kind of this has been a long-standing question in evolutionary biology and there's been a ton of theoretical and empirical work um, trying to address what maintains variation um, in natural populations and traditionally kind of evolutionary there have been kind of two broad evolutionary hypotheses uh, for the maintenance of genetic variation and so one is mutation selection balance we see a, a variation in fitness because mutations are um, kind of you get introduced of deleterious variants that are then kind of slowly eroded, uh, removed by selection. Um, and now I think recently there's been a little bit of a refocus on balancing selection. So it could be that selection itself um, acts to maintain variation. So balancing selection can take a number of different um, forms. So for example, there could be heterozygote advantage where heterozygous individuals have higher fitness than either homozygote. Um, there could be negative frequency dependent selection that would act to maintain variation and also antagonistic selection either between different sexes um, or between different components of fitness. Um, so there's been a ton of work, but I would argue that we still don't have a very good understanding of the mechanisms that maintain variation of fitness in nature. And we also um, especially don't have a good understanding of what causes and maintains genetic variation in fitness over relatively short time scales, which are the time scales right, that are relevant for conservation and whatnot. So the time scales that we all in this room are interested in. Um, so we've been trying to kind of chip away at this question uh, using the Florida scrub jay, this beautiful blue bird here. Um, Florida scrub jays are cooperative breeders, so that means that offspring tend to delay dispersal and stay home to help their parents raise future offspring, future generations. They're restricted to this really unique fire-maintained scrub habitat in Florida. Um, this habitat has been largely destroyed by human development. Um, um, and also there's been a lot of fire suppression. And so because of this, Florida scrub jay populations have declined dramatically. They're federally threatened. Um, and we do actually have a lot of projects in the lab that are interested in kind of conservation genomic tech questions, including looking at inbreeding depression, um, effects of connectivity and whatnot. Um, but a little oddly um, for um, this conference. I'm actually not going to talk about any of those projects right now, but I would be very happy to talk about them later. There are a couple aspects about the biology of the species that makes them very amenable to long-term field studies. So they're non-migratory, they're highly territorial, territorial and philopatric. So what this means is that individuals tend to stay in the same geographic area over time and their offspring don't move very far, so we can also follow their offspring um, over time. They're socially and mostly genetically monogamous. There's a very, very low rate of extra pair paternity. Um, but what this means is that for the most part, we can reconstruct fairly accurate pedigrees from field observations alone. 
And then everybody who does field work will also appreciate that these birds are addicted to peanuts and therefore are very easy to work with in the wild. <laughs> um, I should say that uh, this is not standard field protocol and we actually try to interact with these birds as little as possible. <laughs> Um, so one of the amazing things about the Florida scrub jay is I think it's one of the best studied uh, kind of endangered species in the world. There's been this really long um, individual-based study of the population at Archibald Biological Station starting since 1969. And there's been extensive field work that's gone into this project. So every individual in our population um, is uniquely banded, um, so we can identify individuals in the field. We census um, the entire population once a month collecting very accurate information on individual lifespans for all the individuals in our population over time. Uh, all of the territories are mapped and very carefully monitored. So we go out and find all of the nests for every family group on the site. Um, and we know exactly how many eggs are laid in every nest, when the eggs are laid, um, how many of those eggs hatch, and the fates of all of the nestlings. And so what this means is that we have um, the kind of unique advantage of being able to, be able to measure um, kind of annual and lifetime reproductive success for thousands of individuals um, over time. We also have the ability, because of the careful monitoring, to um, get direct measures of natal dispersal distance. And then importantly for my work, um, my collaborators started taking blood samples from every recruit, so every new nestling, an immigrant into the population, um, starting in around 1999. And so we've have this really nice archive of DNA and blood samples for all the individuals in our population going back for decades. Uh, we also have a number of different ecological um, data that have been collected over time, so measures of habitat quality, um, climate, fire history, food abundance, etc. And so what this means is that over the past half century, we've um, kind of accumulated complete life histories for more than 10,000 individuals on this massive multi-generational pedigree. So this massive line of sticks here shows our population pedigree. Um, and we have about like 10,000 individuals in this pedigree right now. Um, and then as a grad student, I developed genomic resources for the species um, and designed a custom Illumina iSelect B chip. And Gina typed about 3,800 individuals over time. So this figure down here shows the total number of individuals in our population in gray. Um, and the blue bars show the number of individuals we have um, genotype data for in blue. So as you can see, we have nearly exhaustive genotyping of our population for more than 15 years. Um, and this wealth of genomic data coupled with kind of the detailed life history data um, as well as kind of environmental measures and other phenotypic measures for individuals on a known population genealogy provides a really powerful framework for testing evolutionary predictions in nature and trying to understand how natural populations evolve over short time scales. Um, so a lot of our work is interested in trying to characterize like the evolutionary processes that govern allele frequency change in natural populations and also connect trying to connect kind of individual genotype with phenotype. And what I thought I would do today is talk to you about some of our work um, looking at individual variation in fitness. So from our detailed population monitoring data, we know there's quite a bit of variation in uh, individual fitness. So here, uh, this histogram is showing you lifetime reproductive success um, defined as the total number of um, nestlings produced over an individual's lifetime for about a thousand uh, dead individuals. So as you can see, a lot of individuals who um, kind of survive to breed in our population actually never manage to produce, produce any offspring. But then we have a few individuals who've produced like more than 40 offspring during their lifetimes. Since we have multi-generational pedigree data, we can kind of take this a step further and go beyond the single generation proxy for fitness and actually ask, um, can we identify all of the descendants of a given individual in our population over time? 
And so to illustrate this, um, here is an example male who showed up in our population in 1992. He had four kids, none of his kids survived to reproduce, so here is the pedigree of all of his descendants in our population over time. And you can contrast this with another male who showed up in the population around the same time, but like obviously had much higher fitness. <laughs> Um, so one of the things I'm really excited about um, in the lab is we're currently in the middle of trying to sequence the genomes about, of about 4,000 J's. So we're trying to sequence the genomes of everyone in our population um, from 1999 to the present. Um, and then using this data set, we'll be able to kind of track the inheritance of genomic haplotypes down the pedigree um, and associate that with individual phenotypes and start to ask questions about, you know, how much variation is there in kind of long-term individual genetic contributions to the population over time and how can we link variation in individual genetic contributions to try to explain observed allele frequency changes. Um, but this work is ongoing and so I won't um, be able to talk about that today. So today I would thought I would focus on kind of the work we've been doing on trying to understand variation in kind of the single generation proxy of fitness, lifetime reproductive success. So one of the first things we did was just try to map it. Um, so if we perform a genome-wide association study of lifetime reproductive success in our population, we actually identify a few um, alleles of large effect that are associated with variation in individual fitness. So here I'll be showing a lot of these Manhattan plots. And, um, so these are figures that show the minus log 10p value of all of this on the y-axis of all of our SNPs arrayed across the genome. Um, and we found two large effect alleles, one on chromosome one and one on chromosome three, um, that are significantly associated with variation in lifetime reproductive success. Um, so, you know, in thinking about individual fitness, it's also useful to remember that fitness is this really complicated composite phenotype, right? Um, and so if you think about the life cycle of a typical sexually reproducing individual, um, Fitness has a lot of different components, and also natural selection can act on these different stages of the life cycle, right? So for instance, variation in individual lifetime reproductive success is going to be influenced by variation in individual survival, so survival of zygotes or adults. Um, this means that there's opportunity for viability selection. Not all individuals who survive to become adults actually successfully um, breed, and so there are opportunities for sexual selection um, that may contribute to variation in fitness. Individuals will vary in fecundity or clutch size, right? And then finally, um, there could be variation in the transmission of gametes or kind of opportunities for gametic selection or segregation distortion. So Tim Prout in the 60s was the first to point out that a lot of the traditional tests of kind of contemporary selection that are looking for um, uh, allele frequency or genotype frequency differences across generations um, actually confound these different fitness components. And so really rigorous inference of selection should try to test for selection at different life cycle stages separately. Christensen and Frydenberg in the 70s came up with this really elegant um, hierarchical series of tests called selection component analyses, um, which allows you to kind of estimate selection coefficients for these different life, for these different fitness or selection components separately. The original statistical framework was developed using kind of random mother offspring pairs. Um, and then there's been kind of work by Joe Nadeau that kind of extends that analysis for if you have um, sampling of full families. Um, and then more recently, Patrick Monahan, uh, and John Kelly and colleagues have kind of adapted the selection component analysis framework um, to accommodate genomic data and genotype likelihoods. So we actually set out um, to do selection component analysis, but in trying to think through the process, we realized that actually the environmental heterogeneity, right, 
plays a huge role in individual and in kind of contributing to variation in fitness. And so maybe um, we should try to take a different approach and do kind of a genome-wide association study where we can actually accommodate kind of environmental variables. Um, so I thought I would walk you through kind of some of the highlights of the analyses we've done so far. Um, let's start with gamete transmission. So this is actually um, pretty much the same thing as the original selection component framework because uh, I can't imagine environment playing a huge role in gamete transmission, but I could be wrong. Um, so here the hypothesis we're asking is, um, we're testing is whether or not heterozygote individuals transmit both alleles equally frequently to all of their offspring. So in this example, nuclear pedigree, if dad is a heterozygote, does he produce an equal frequency of heterozygote and homozygote offspring? So the answer to this question, we developed a full likelihood approach where we kind of went through our entire data set um, and identified any trio where at least one of the parents is a heterozygote for our locus of interest. Um, and then we counted up the individual, their offspring of each, diff, um, each genotype and then using kind of, you know, the binomial distribution, we can estimate the probability the male transmits um, a given allele and the probability the female transmits a given allele. And then we can use a likelihood ratio test to ask whether or not this probability is significantly different from 0.5, which is the null hypothesis. Um, so after multiple testing correction, we found kind of three regions of the genome that showed evidence of segregation and distortion. Two of them we don't quite believe um, because one of them is like largely driven by two uh, very two males who had a lot of offspring and had strong distortion, um, showed strong distortion. And then one of them, there seems um, from kind of recent whole genome sequencing data, there seems to be an indel um, very close to the SNP. And so we were worried about how that might influence kind of hybridization in our genotyping process. Um, but there is one SNP on chromosome 10 that we're fairly confident does show um, segregation distortion in our population. And if you can, if we plot the likelihood surface, so I'm showing um, probability of transmission in males on the y-axis and probability of transmission in females on the x-axis, you can see that um, we see this kind of gametic selection or segregation distortion in males where males are transmitting one allele 60% of the time. Um, I will say that we are working on improving the annotation of our genome, and so I cannot tell you any like just so stories about genes are are nearby any of the hits that we find. Um, but it's kind of interesting that we do find some evidence of segregation distortion, um, and that it's really only present in males in our population. All right, for the other fitness components, survival, breeding status, and fecundity, we took the same, we took um, a mixed model approach. So I'll introduce them here. So here the response variable is either did you survive to a given time interval, um, conditional and survival, did you become a breeder, like a social breeder, and then um, we had various measures of uh, fecundity, but I'll focus on kind of numbers of eggs or clutch size. Uh, for all of our models, we included the kinship matrix, the control for population structure, and we also included natal year and natal nest as random effects. And then kind of the beauty and curse of having a lot of data and knowing a lot about the natural history of your organism is that we know there's a whole host of other factors that might influence variation in individual fitness. And um, so we kind of went through and assembled everything we thought could possibly matter. Um, and so this includes attributes about the individual, so their inbreeding coefficient, we know there's inbreeding depression in our population, um, hatch date, immigrant status, etc. We also included attributes about their natal nest, so how many helpers were there, what's the territory size or habitat composition of the natal territory, um, what's the age and experience of their parents. Um, and then we also included a bunch of variables that um, changed year to year, so population density, we know there are some density dependent effects, um, rainfall, temperature, uh, acorn abundance, etc. So we spent a lot of time um, trying to figure out 
how to accommodate these variables and we ended up first doing a performing a variable selection step where we went through for every single one of our models kind of identified which of these um, environmental variables were important and then once we uh, figured out which fix effects to include we then went through and fitted the genotype of all of our SNPs across the genome and essentially so essentially what we're doing here is performing a genome-wide association study for different fitness components. Um, so we tested a bunch of different fitness components and we also fit models for males and females separately um, and we also fit models with everybody and included sex as a fixed effect um, and I don't have time to talk about everything so I thought I would just give you some of the highlights of what we found. Um, so survival, we looked at survival, we used kind of logistic models to look at survival to different um, milestones in the life of a scrub jay. Um, so here's kind of a typical life of a Florida scrub jay. Um, we banned and sampled nestlings when they're 11 days old, so that's when our analyses start. Scrub jays um, typically fledge or leave the nest around day 18, um, and they like hang out and pretend to be pine cones until around day 30. Um, and that's when they're a little bit more mobile. <laughs> By day 90, they're nutritionally independent from their parents. By day 300, they're physiologically capable of breeding, um, but they may not have kind of attained status as a social breeder. Um, and then we also ask whether or not um, they'd be established as a breeder. Um, so for females, we found kind of intriguing results for early life survival. Um, so if we're looking at survival of females from day 11 to day 30, so essentially fledging success, um, the fixed effects we found were important to consider for this particular time interval was kind of hatch date, which makes sense, inbreeding coefficient also makes sense. We know there's inbreeding depression um, and drought index of the year. And after controlling for these effects, we found one um, locus on chromosome 14 that was strongly associated with survival. Um, and kind of starting out, we kind of assume that, you know, survival and fitness is this complicated trait. We're never going to find anything. Um, and so really we should just take a polygenic approach. Um, but it's kind of surprising to find a large effect allele. So here I'm showing you um, survival probabilities of females um, with the three different genotypes at this given SNP. And you can see that the alternate homozygotes have a difference of survival of like survival probabilities of like 0.3, which is high. Um, and I guess what we can say is that there's clearly some genetic component to early life survival um, in our population, which is interesting. Uh, for males, um, we found kind of large effect alleles for survival in a later time interval. So survival from day 90 to day 300. This is essentially overwintering survival. Um, it was comforting to see that acorn abundance was selected uh, as an important variable in these models because we know that um, Florida scrub jays eat acorns when insect abundance is low over winter. And so it's really nice to see that acorn abundance is um, important for overwinter survival. Um, and here we find kind of two regions of the genome on chromosome 2 and one region of the genome on chromosome 26 um, that's, again, significantly associated with survival in males. Um, for fecundity, we considered a number of different um, ways of measuring fecundity, but here I thought I would show uh, variation in clutch size. So this is number of eggs in, your, in the first clutch um, in, of the season. Um, and so things that kind of mattered, which made, makes sense based on the biology of the birds. So nest date matters. We know there are important seasonal effects. Um, drought index, the relatedness of the pair um, is associated with variation in clutch size. And then interestingly enough, for males, it was like whether or not he was an immigrant mattered. And then for females, it was the number of immigrants in that mating pair, um, the number of helpers and whether or not she, uh, her mate was a new breeder, so had any breeding experience. 
Um, and so if we kind of look for adaptogenic effects associated with variation in clutch size, we can see there's one region in chromosome, on chromosome 14 that's associated with female fecundity, and then we find um, kind of five different regions associated with fecundity in males. So overall, um, we've identified kind of two markers associated with lifetime reproductive success in our population, and then about kind of 22 regions of the genome associated with variation in fecundity, um, and then a few regions associated with survival. Um, here I'm just showing you kind of our, the estimate of effect sizes for all of the different models that we ran. And, you know, we, there were a couple questions that we wanted to ask with these SNP-based estimates. So one is, you know, if we find an allele that clearly has a large if, impact on fitness, is it increasing in our population over time? We have allele frequency data and we can see um, if there's any association between effect size estimates and allele frequency change. Turns out, no, these alleles are not increasing um, in frequency in our population over time. And that's because if you look at the effect size estimates for these different SNPs, they actually um, differ in magnitude across uh, different, or different sign, sorry, across different fitness components. And so there's some evidence of trade-offs um, that's maintaining kind of, uh, maintaining these alleles at kind of intermediate or low frequencies. Um, so we actually wanted to take a more polygenic approach and instead of focusing on um, kind of outliers that we've identified in these associations, we wanted to ask what can we learn about looking at genome-wide patterns. Um, so we uh, ended up looking at correlations in genome-wide effect sizes for kind of suggestive SNPs. So we just filtered our data set for any SNP that had a p-value, a raw p-value of like 0.1 um, in any analysis, and then looked at the correlation and effect sizes between these SNPs. Um, so I'm gonna fill in this correlation matrix, um, and you'll see that there's kind of all our male-male correlations will be up here, female-female correlations here, uh, male-female correlations here, and then I've just listed our different, um, so we have measures of lifetime reproductive success in two different groups of individuals, so just individuals who survived the breed or everybody in our data set. Um, and then our different fitness components here, so gametic, like segregation distortion, uh, different annual reproductive success, um, number of hatchlings, number of eggs, so different measures of fecundity, um, different measure, uh, measure of sexual selection, and then different measures of survival. Um, so one of our questions was, okay, we know there's a lot of variation in lifetime reproductive success. What drives this variation? And so if you look at um, correlations in effect size estimates genome-wide with of um, lifetime reproductive success with our individual fitness components, you can see that we see the strongest correlations with survival. So here, survival is the primary driver of variation. Variation in survival is the primary driver of variation in lifetime reproductive productive success in our species. It makes sense given, you know, a relatively long lived organism, um, but it's kind of nice to be able to pick this out uh, from our um, genetic association data. We then looked for kind of evidence of trade-offs genome-wide, so now I'm kind of filling in correlations among um, different fitness components and males and females separately. And, oh, I forgot to mention red is positive correlations, blue is negative correlations. Um, and we were able to kind of find evidence of your classic life history trade-off between survival and reproduction in both males and females, where you see kind of alleles that are associated with long, um, higher survival are negatively, have negative effects in fecundity. And then finally, if we look at kind of correlations of effects between males and females, um, we find some, there's quite a bit of blue boxes in here, so we find some evidence of sexual conflict operating across the genome. Um, and most notably, the uh, effect sizes uh, for female lifetime reproductive success are negatively correlated for male reproductive success. Um, so to summarize, uh, we've spent many years um, kind of doing this really detailed analysis of kind of 
what how much variation there is in lifetime reproductive success as well as different components of fitness. Um, and so far we uh, have identified a number of large effect alleles that are associated with variation in um, gamete transmission, survival, fecundity, and also total lifetime reproductive success. Um, and using the effect sizes we've estimated from these genome-wide association studies, uh, we've, be able, we've been able to kind of find evidence of trade-offs, life history trade-offs as well as sexual conflict across the genome, showing that selection may actually be playing an important role in maintaining genetic variation for fitness in our population. Um, one of the other goals uh, for doing this analysis is that, you know, in theory, if you can predict um, the fitness or selection, or you, if you can estimate selection components um, for each genotype for these different life cycle stages, you should be able to like add them all together in order to predict allele frequency change over time. Um, turns out we haven't figured out how to do that while accounting for environmental heterogeneity. Um, so if any Anybody has ideas I would love to chat um, but we are we have performed kind of your classic selection component analysis where we're just we're ignoring environment and just looking at kind of estimating genotypic um, changes in genotype frequencies over time to see if that's predictive allele frequency change um, but that's something that we're working on now all right, so with that, um, none of the work that I do would be possible without the many, many um, wonderful students, um, interns and staff at Archibald Biological Station who've collected the field data over the years. Um, thank you to my lab. The work I talked about was done in close collaboration with Alyssa Cosgrove and Andy Clark at Cornell. Thank you to my funding sources and thank you for listening. Happy to take questions. You. That was truly amazing. The level of detail that you have there is just incredible. Thanks. Um, okay, time for a couple of questions. Have mics around? Uh, amazing talk as always, Nancy. Um, so you were looking at like uh, kind of like the interaction of the different selection components in that triangle heat map there uh, and kind of talking about uh, using it as a polygenic approach. But are you actually going to do you have uh, plans to actually use like just polygenic scoring for some of these different phenotypes and then see if there's like any if that's if these polygenic scoring for these different phenotypes are actually able to predict individuals who have like higher fecundity in your population? Yeah, that's a great question. We've kind of gone back and forth about whether or not we should estimate polygenic scores. Um, one of my worries is that while we have a nice sample size, like um, for kind of the viability selection, our sample size is like 2,000 or something. So they're large for non-human studies, but they're still relatively small. And so I worry a little bit about kind of the accuracy of our effect size estimates, especially for small effect alleles. Um, so that's why we've been avoiding trying to use polygenic scores. Um, ha have you ever uh, run analyses in the absence of all the amazing ecological data that you have? In other words, like how wrong would we be without <laughs> controlling for <laughs> those sorts of data that you have and maybe not everybody else has? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So for, um, we did actually, run, we've run like all the possible variation models. So we um, have run the um, association studies with just random effects and no fixed effects. Um, and oftentimes it kind of varies depending on the fitness component. But in some cases we see that if we include fixed effects, we actually pull out kind of more hits. Um, and then in other cases, it introduces a not controlling for environment, introduces a bunch of false positives. So it's highly dependent on the fitness component of interest. We have one here. Um, this is such a cool talk, such a cool system. Um, I was curious about um, the SNPs that you found, the hits that you found for viability at the earliest 
um, mm-hmm. stage of the of life. Um, does that change over time if you try to um, find alleles that are correlated with survival at later uh, life stages? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think for the most part, we didn't see that many sign changes like for survival over time. Um, but we definitely see the negative association with fecundity or not. But yeah, no, that's a great question. We have the data and I think the answer is no, but um, it will definitely double check. Very cool. Question. Hi, um, awesome talk. That was just amazing. But I had a question about, um, like, you, uh, sorry, I kind of lost my vocabulary. No worries. <laughs> um, but have you uh, looked at, like, um, like, behavioral plasticity among individuals and if there's any way to, like, account for that? In- <laughs> Look for behavioral plasticity. Um... I guess what exactly do you mean? Like for I guess what to like traits? account for that yeah. um, when it comes to lifetime reproductive success. Um, so what I can tell you is that, so they're long-lived organisms and they um, kind of breed throughout their lifetime. So we do for those, for kind of fitness components where we have repeated measures, we do estimate repeatability. And for things like, you know, clutch size, repeatability is fairly high in our population. Although I don't know how much of that is um, just because there's not that much variation in clutch size in our population. Basically, everybody has three or four eggs. Um, So, but we haven't thought about trying to like quantify how much plasticity there is necessarily um we i guess by kind of throwing all of the fixed effects we try to accommodate any of that right so if there's variation in um kind of phenology we can account for that but i don't know if that answered your question yeah no thank you here we go one last question up here. Oh, yeah. okay. oh. <laughs> so I'm wondering, like, uh, what kind of effective effect size you use? Like, do you mainly focus on the uh, low side with really strong effect size, or you also include some small effect size? But if you accumulate them together, the effect size might be huge. Oh, interesting. Yeah, no, we haven't tried as doing like chromosome partitioning yet. Um, so we've looked at effect sizes for individual loci um, and tried to look at patterns at individual loci. And then we also looked at genome-wide patterns, either with all of our SNPs um, in the analysis or just filtering for suggestive SNPs. And our suggestive SNPs set does include some smaller effect alleles because we're using a very lenient threshold but yeah there are there's like way more that we could do by um but we haven't done like regional heritability or chromosome partitioning yet really cool study system um i was wondering um if there is any correlation between the number of helpers and uh reproduct or um yeah, reproductive success, or sorry, not reproductive success, but like fledgling success. Yep, yeah, so um, we have another project where we're trying to estimate directly the effects of helper, like do helpers help, like what are the effects of helpers on um, variation in reproductive success? And yes, we do see that um, having more helpers leads to higher um, production of independence. It's a little complicated because there's this like interaction between territory size and number of helpers so if you have a small territory it's actually bad to have too many helpers because then they end up being competition especially once the offspring are nutritionally independent Um, and they also helpers also contribute to increased breeder survival which will have implications for lifetime reproductive success all right let's uh thank you